Do you sometimes feel like you're a completely different person at work and at home? Do you worry that if you were entirely yourself, then you just wouldn't fit in? And you sometimes wish you could do more of what you love during the day. In this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Sarah Goulding. She's a portfolio GP. She's a training program director and also a Shapes Toolkit trainer. She's a career coach and head of coaching at The Joyful Doctor. We chat about how you can bring your whole self to work without having to chop off the parts of you that make you you in order to do your job. Now, Sarah's been on her own journey and now helps others to find out how they can work and do work that they love. And we discuss how we can so often fall into the trap of being miserable because we don't know anything different. And sometimes we see how unhappy other people are at work and think it must be normal. We discuss how finding out what your core strengths are and developing and crafting a role to play to those strengths can bring the joy back into your work and your life. So listen to find out how to find out what your strengths are. Find out why this really, really matters. And listen to find some key questions you can ask yourself to transform your life and... Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, life hacks for doctors and busy professionals who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr Rachel Morris. I'm a GP, 10 coach, speaker and specialist in teaching resilience. And I'm interested in how we can wake up and be excited about going to work no matter what. I've had 20 years experience of working in the NHS, both on the front line and teaching leadership and resilience. I know what it's like to feel overwhelmed, worried about making a mistake and one crisis away from not coping. 2021 promises to be a particularly challenging year. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we were facing unprecedented levels of burnout. We have been compared to frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water, working harder and longer, and the heat has been turned up so slowly that we hardly notice the extra long days becoming the norm and have got used to the low-grade feelings of stress and exhaustion. Let's face it, frogs generally only have two choices, stay in the pan and be boiled alive or jump out of the pan and leave. But you are not a frog and that's where this podcast comes in. You have many more options than you think you do. It is possible to be master of your own destiny and to craft your work and life so that you can thrive, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Through training as an executive and team coach, I discovered some hugely helpful resilience and productivity tools that transformed the way I approached my work. I've been teaching these principles over the last few years as the Shapes Toolkit programme, because if you're happier at work, you'll simply do a better job. In this podcast, I'll be inviting you inside the minds of friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this, so that together we can take back control to thrive, not just survive in our work and our lives and love what we do again. For those of you listening to the podcast who need to get some continuous professional development hours under your belt, did you know that we create a CPD form for every episode so that you can use it for your documentation and in your appraisal? Now, if you're a doctor and you're a fan of inspiring CPD and you're sick of wasting a lot of time you don't have on boring and irrelevant stuff, then why not check out our Permission to Thrive membership? This is a new venture, a joint venture between me and Caroline Walker, who's the Joyful Doctor. And every month we're going to be releasing a webinar fully focused on helping you thrive in work and in life. Every webinar is accompanied by an optional workbook with a reflective activity so that you can take control of your work and your life. You can increase your well-being and you can design a life that you're going to love. You've got to get those hours, so why not make your CPD count? Choose CPD that's good for you. So check out the link to find out more. Now, thanks for listening to my shameless plug and back to the episode. It's really great to have with me on the podcast today, Dr. Sarah Goulding. Now, Sarah is a careers coach. She's a GP. She's an appraiser, a trainer. Sarah, what, what else do you do? I'm a, I'm a GP mentor. I do wellbeing talks. I'm head of coaching at The Joyful Doctor. Um, and I usually forget one or two other roles along the way. 
<laughs> wow, massive, massive portfolio. Oh, so I wanted to get Sarah on because we've been having some uh, really interesting conversations the last few days, all about well, resilience, well-being, workplace well-being, all that sort of stuff that I'm really passionate about. But Sarah has got a really interesting, useful take, I think, on you know how we can bring our whole selves to work and how we can make sure that we're doing something that fits us and our personalities rather than trying to mold ourselves into something that we're not. And that's something that's really close to my own heart, having sort of felt for several years in, in some previous jobs that I was maybe a square peg in a round hole and, and things like that. But Sarah, I think, you know, you've got a, a very interesting background, not only in coaching, but you've got your own story too. So tell me a little bit about where your interest in all this started. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've always wanted to be a medic and I did the classic go straight through, go to med school, do your house officer jobs and then sort of have a breather. Took a bit of time out, did some work abroad, did, did an expedition, went through GP training, but knew that I wanted to do more than just that. I've always wanted to have a portfolio. Um, I've always had lots of interest. And so that really appealed to me. So I was lucky to do a training as a senior GP registrar in medical education at the end of my GP training. So I did that, did the thing where you classically follow your husband around if you're married to a medic. And eventually, after a bit of low coming here and there, landed where we've now settled. And did more locuming and then became a GP partner. Along the way, I gathered more interests in family planning, started appraising and became a, a training programme director of a GP training scheme and had two kids and slowly started to burn out. Um, and I did not see it coming. One winter, I saw an advert from NHS England saying, are you interested in some coaching? And I thought, oh, what's that? Okay, sure, I'll put my name down, but I probably won't get it. And then afterwards thought, oh, actually, the questions they're asking, they're looking for people burnt out, aren't they? Okay, well, I won't get it. And I did get it. <laughs> I was one of the 250 out of 3,000 who applied, <gasps> which I think is striking wow. in itself. Yeah, yeah. This is the winter of 2017. And I was allocated it and that was my first little warning sign but I thought oh I probably just blagged it and got through <laughs> and through that winter I didn't see the signs and I didn't think I was working in hard enough to justify the title of burnout and there were lots of reasons within the practice why I would have become burnt out We'd lost a colleague to cancer very quickly the previous summer. Another colleague was off having treatment. Our entire nursing team got poached by another practice or <gasps> jumped because they weren't happy. So we'd, we, we were very low on numbers and it was your classic NHS winter pushing on, trying to meet the targets. And I was working in my little room, not seeing my colleagues who on a night out I got on brilliantly with, but at work we started getting really snappy with each other. And I got a rather terse email from a colleague asking why I hadn't done a visit and sharing that with all of my other colleagues. Um, and I, had, I was awake till three in the morning and thought, why am I putting myself through this? Um, if I suddenly got a cancer diagnosis, would I be happy with having lived like this, where actually I'd been counting down to retirement and looking for ways out, but not really seeing those as warning signs. So I resigned as a partner and it wasn't really until I left in a kind of complete brain fog by then that I could look up and go, oh, I'm really not that well, am I? And this is only two and a half years ago now but I went through practitioner health, I having Googled burnout and met all the criteria and went to see this fantastic counsellor through practitioner health. He said, well, you know, Sarah, it's really common for medical professionals to burn out. And even then I looked at her gobsmacked and went, uh, what? <laughs> A, what is burnout? B, why would I have it? And C, really? I'm not working full time. I'm not, quote unquote, on the front line. I'm just a part time job share partner. You know, it's not that much. I'm not doing that many sessions. Um, 
it must be something wrong with me that I've become burnt out. Um, and on the day that I drove away from my, my partnership, very amicably, um, I received an email asking if I wanted to become a GP mentor. And I had one of these real kind of oh, moments where I went, oh, yes, I forgot. When I was first training in medical education, the thing I was really passionate about was supporting doctors. And at the time, I didn't have enough experience. I didn't have enough understanding. And that just reignited that, that kind of forgotten passion that I'd always had in university, I'd help run the university nightline supporting students that it, I did behavioral sciences as part of my BMED Sci. It had always been there, but I'd forgotten about it. And so the last couple of years, I've been trying different things out to see what fits and developing this portfolio that now supports my massive passion for supporting doctors to sort of live a life that keeps them healthy but also fulfilled and that kind of full version of themselves because I've been there myself and so now I'm coaching people I'm mentoring I'm appraising them I'm also a, yeah a TPD again at a GP training scheme and I'm able to sort of live that life that I'm passionate about and so I consider myself incredibly lucky. Mm. I'm so glad you've been able to find something that you feel you can bring your whole self to. I think it's fascinating that you were burnt out without experiencing it. I, I think that's the experience of a lot, sorry, without realizing it. I think that's yeah. the experience of a lot of doctors. I remember my first coaching session, I, I think I sobbed my way through it. <laughs> I think that's probably true for most most of us when you suddenly sort of get to it. And, and my first coaching session was after an epiphany. I think it was New Year. And I said to my sister and my husband, oh, what are your New Year's revolu resolutions this year? And they said, well, we don't have any, Rachel, but yours is to get a different job. I was like, really? Can I do that? <laughs> Can I? Is, is that possible? Um, and, and just feeling that this feeling of unhappiness in what I was doing was normal was normal because everyone was like that, because everyone was working really hard. Everyone was struggling and that was just normal. And why should I expect anything from myself if everyone else was having to suck it up? And I think your other point about the fact that I wasn't full time, you know, I'm not full time. I don't, you know, I'm not rushed off my feet. Therefore, I, I can't be burnt out, can I? And we forget that there are other reasons and other causes for burnout, not just about workload and pressure. It's about satisfaction and purpose and meaning and relationships relationships and all those all those sorts of things so oh so you know why is it that we are so bad at recognizing this I mean we presumably we're quite good at recognizing it in our patients I don't know I, d I don't think burnout as an entity that the World Health Organization has now given a classification to is genuinely recognized I think it's seen as a layman's term for I'm a bit tired, I've been working too hard, or I'm running around after my kids, I haven't had time for myself. And in it, although it can have very similar effects to things like depression and anxiety, and actually there is an overlap, um, and people who have burnout are more likely to be taking SSRI antidepressants, for example, I don't think it's given the same weight as a condition that affects your mental health and all of your well-being. And I think that's part of why I've been doing loads of talks, particularly during the pandemic, about well-being and trying to just spot it and recognise it in yourself. Because as you say, we're often surrounded by people that appear to be under the same conditions, but you never really know what's going on in their inner world. Um, and just because somebody else might be choosing to live life unhappily and exhausted and not really fulfilled doesn't mean that we have to make those same choices because we've all got our own interests and values and things that bring us purpose. And I think in medicine that you so early on you have this kind of uh, group think 
We glorify overwork. We glorify tiredness. I remember the whole sleep when you're dead thing as a junior doctor and thinking, oh, well, but we had it better than the people that went before us. So we must be OK, because that's what we were always told. And I think that's true now. There's this real handed down historical mantle of you must dot, dot, dot. And then you feel that to be a member of the club, that's what you should do. And I think that includes the cynicism, the sort of gallows humour, which can be really funny and bonding, but it can be very negative and cynical and can lead to kind of, and I think, an erosion of your values and your reason for wanting to do stuff. And I think it can be hard to notice when that that has seeped into becoming something that you've taken on as how you view life. And I think in burnout, that can be really insidious. Um, I certainly found that. And I, I found the not caring as much about things a real element for me. I expected the tiredness. Um, yeah. Yeah. You just think it's normal, don't you? You think stress is normal. And it, when, when I do talks about how to be happy at work, I've got this sort of... Um, these happiness traps that we fall into and one of them and thinking is that stress and tiredness is normal and I'm just reminded of a, a physio who said to me that she seeing this runner who'd hurt his knee and he'd came in and he said oh well you know you need to help me fix this but I'm a runner being injured is normal isn't it and she said no it's not it's not normal to be injured I think we think that to be a doctor, and, I th and I'm sure this is the same for lawyers and other professionals that to be stressed and knackered is normal now it is frequent but it's not normal and there was this dreadful um statistic that came out just before um the covid pandemic i think it was about november 2019 i think they they measured something like 93.9 percent of gps could be assessed as having a mild to moderate or even moderate to severe to severe mental health problem um and and i think most of that will be burnout but we've got this Thing that you know being happy isn't normal we're all going to be stressed yeah being tired being tired is normal and I love what you just said that just because someone else is choosing to live life unhappily doesn't mean that we need to that is really powerful and it's taken me a really long time to honestly believe that mm. because I felt a lot of shame and guilt and being less than for again, in quotes, you know, not being able to cope or not thriving. And I think it's incredibly important to go, what are your professional values? And what are your personal values? And what do you notice about the difference between those two? Because it's fine if they are, it's absolutely fine to want to do your job really well, passionately, be ambitious, be driven, but also want to be a fully present mother, partner, daughter, friend, runner, whatever. Um, and it's how we give equal importance to both of those, or, or at least give yourself time to allow yourself to notice what you notice when you look at those two things and say, is there something that I'm not meeting? And if there is, how do, what, what needs to be done to rebalance that? There are things that we can do about crafting our job. And I know you and I have talked a lot about this and you had that lovely analogy of a, a shape sorter. Can you just, yes. just tell, tell us about that? Because I think that was really helpful when you're thinking about career development or thinking about a workplace that, that fits you. It was really helpful for me anyway. Yeah, I've been gradually as I said, processing everything that's happened to me and the people that I help um, and meet day to day. And I think particularly in medicine, but I'm sure this is true for other professions, you have this perception that you have to choose a particular career path and you might be shaped like a star and the career paths you see ahead of you are probably one of maybe 10 particular ones and I certainly went through hospital medicine going don't want that don't want that don't want that and it's it's a ruling out often rather than a ruling in so you may choose the path that you think well okay I can see a triangle that looks that looks roughly about right for me and so you 
jump in, you push through, and before you know it, you've left bits of yourself behind. And it's not till you've gone to the other side because we're so good at jumping through the hoops, the assessments, the getting the jobs. We're quite competitive. We're selected for these perfectionist, A-type, very um, sacrificial qualities that you don't really realise till you get to the other side of it often that you've chosen a shape that doesn't actually fit you that well and you don't really like the job that you've got the other side and actually you've left really important bits of yourself behind and for me that was kind of a more playful part a more creative part um, and a bit where I could do lots of different things and that, that luckily in general practice you can and I tried lots of different things on the way but I think we, we make choices so early on and there are very few sort of stopping points at which you can stand there and reassess that because it feels quite binary. You either continue or you're out where you start from the beginning and everything that you've done is lost. And I think obviously those are, some of those assumptions are false, but I'm really keen that people feel that they do give themselves permission to step to one side and perhaps look in on their life and go, how, how is this fitting with what I think fits with me? And also those personal values, as I mentioned before, they may change. You know, when I started training, I was single, I lived alone, I had a natty little sports car. And by the end of training uh, and going into the real world, I had a Skoda. <laughs> I'd follow my husband around for his job and was settling down and wanting kids. My, my priorities changed and that's fine. Um, but sometimes our career needs to change along with it. Um, yeah, I know you had a long chat with Jane Dacre about that, about how the, the working life is designed around a 50s man who has a, a woman at home ready to give him a martini and sort out the house. And I think that's absolutely true, and particularly for working women. Yeah, I mean, gosh, the amount of times I've just thought to myself, I wish I had a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I think my husband thinks that as well. He wishes he had a <laughs> wife too. <laughs> We've both come off. <laughs> We've both come a cropper on that front. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that there was, I heard it said, I can't remember who said it, but we're expected to, give everything to work like we don't have a family and we're supposed to give our, everything to our family and home like like we don't have a job. And that is just, you can't, you can't actually do that. So we've got to make it work for ourselves. We've got to find ways of crafting the job that we are in that's going to suit us more. And, you know, I'm, I have no agenda, you know, if doctors want to go do something completely different, brilliant. If they want to stay in their jobs and craft them to help themselves, brilliant as well. It's all about finding what works but I am a passionate believer in the fact that it is possible to stay in medicine and these other professions without burning out without leaving and enjoy what you do so how would you suggest someone would go about you know checking in on what their values are and things like that because actually I think that one of the problems is we're so conditioned we're so forced into that star shape that we actually forget what what we're really about it's sometimes just forget what makes us tick don't we I think absolutely and I think we can you can sometimes live in an echo chamber can't you you can talk to the people who are just like you and therefore will have similar opinions and experiences and for me that that was the really powerful thing of either having a coach or seeing this counsellor and just somebody external to you who can kind of help you tease out what's important to you and then help you hold that that critical but empathic mirror up and go okay well how does this look how does your present look compared to where you want to be and then in a compassionate way rather than a judgmental way because we all do things with the best of intentions go okay well what 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 is their scope to change what about your reality can be altered now and what would you like to change um i think there are there are lots of resources for doing it but there are also lots of very skilled professionals who who can do that as well mm. so you know one-to-one -one coaching is 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 
just brilliant, I, I think, for things like that. But there's also sort of exercises you can do and values exercises and, and strength finders as well. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about strengths as well, because when I first started looking at what else I wanted to do, I didn't really know what I was good at. And I, I know that when you're, you know, looking at what's going to fit you, it, it's really important to do what you love. And often doing what you love is doing what you're good at. They, yes. they, they tend to go hand in hand. You, you very, you're very rarely really good at something that you really hate. <laughs> um, but strength is, is difficult and it's something we just completely didn't go into at medical school or even, I think in training I did a Myers-Briggs um, uh, questionnaire at one point, but that was when I was, I was very young, wasn't really into self-reflection or, or whatever. Um, but I think in hindsight, I wish I'd paid more attention to the Myers-Briggs thing, actually. I'm, I'm an extreme extrovert and so locking myself away in a room all day doesn't really, doesn't really do it for me with, with no other sort of colleague contact. But how do we find out what our strengths are? And then how do we make sure we're playing to them in, in work? Absolutely. I think, as you say, there are lots of exercises and there's a good free tool, the, the Values in Action tool, Strengths Finder, um, you can fill in and that gives you sort of lists 20 potential strengths. This is from the world of positive psychology, for which there's a lot of good evidence. Um, and I found mine was fascinating and made perfect sense for why I've ended up with the portfolio where I'm at things like kindness, pursuit of excellence and beauty. And that can be anything. It can be all sorts of things. So there are lots of different things on that website. It's VIA. So that's, we can certainly put that in the, in the notes. Um, there's also exercises that you can do in terms of finding your why in like Simon Sinek um, did a famous TED talk over 10 years ago now, who was an advertising executive and said, it's all very well doing a job, but unless you know why you're doing it, you can't, you're not, you're not aiming in the right direction. And he completely changed a high paid job and went to do something completely different because he was, and he's got some good exercises in his book. And there's a workbook you've got in terms of starting with why and then you can start to look at your how and your what. And I think often we start from the other way in. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And the why comes after. So I find that a useful exercise as well. Yeah, that's interesting because most yeah medics are thinking they want to do something else. Start with, yeah, what else can I do? Right, what's being advertised? What? And that's completely, Absolutely. completely the wrong way around. And I'd really encourage, you know, anyone who's listening to this that's, that's interested to go and do that VIA strength survey. And we'll, we'll put the link in the show notes. It is really eye-opening. Yeah, I thought I was going to get really high up on teaching and um sort of pastoral type stuff but I, I ended up being quite high on communication of ideas and yes. and um connecting with people and and um I think there was another strength server I did with woo which is called winning others over and I was like oh that's interesting I probably should have been in sales or advertising or something <laughs> my strength is with the ideation and then and that's really helped me work out how I then need to work I then need to work with a team and hand stuff over and make sure that I've got people around me who are really good at doing the detail and, and looking at stuff. And it's, it's something really important to do. And I guess in, even in a partnership, do it as well, because you will find that there are lots of other people around with different strengths. So it's, it's okay to be different. And I think that's one thing I felt was a lot of guilt that I wasn't performing or, or wasn't enjoying stuff as much as that, that person there, but probably they just had a completely different strengths profile to me. Absolutely. And I think, if I'd looked at, you know, different doctors I've worked at over the years or appraised or mentored, you know, I made peace with constantly running about 20 minutes late because that was how I felt comfortable practicing medicine. But it took me <laughs> about 15 years to, to finally go, this is me and how I am. If I rate my goodness, uh, my skills as a GP as to whether I run on time, that's really a false test. That's not how, and, and, and I think one of the difficulties is that you don't get that much feedback. And often the feedback, you know, the, the appraisal system as was, was almost an exercise in 
self-flagellation, you know, <laughs> prove that you are okay, otherwise we'll assume that you're not. And, you know, where are the times where you could have been better? And, I, and that can also be true in medical education. You know, what are you putting on your portfolio? Oh, the bit that you needed to learn more about. And I, I'm really happy that appraisal has changed this, for this year, and I really hope it will continue in that it's much more about the what have you done well, what's been challenging, how are you, and much more of a seeing the doctor as a human being. And of course, we're all going to be different and have different strengths. And we all know that as patients, we seek out doctors that we like communicating with. And that's OK. That's the rich variety of life. Um, but yeah, I was very hard on myself and learning to also start to pick up that self critical chatter and I'm seeing that a lot in in the well-being talks if you say to people look if I had a bin to put all your unhelpful thinking what would you put in it and there were such recurrent themes I'm not good enough I'm not fast enough my colleagues are probably better they're thinking this of me um what if I get things wrong what if I get a complaint and I just think there's this very pervasive thing of not looking, not celebrating our victories. And we don't know, particularly, I think, in quite outpatient based specialties, when we've done a good job, a good job is when we don't then see people again, or we've held people's hand through a really difficult situation. And it's rare that you get that feedback. And I think it's how, as you say, you look for positives where you can notice that you've done a good job yourself and I used to try and say to people okay your task for your next appraisal is to write where you've managed a really difficult situation really well because you are doing that every week a really complex social situation a patient whose diagnosis you can't get to the bottom of and it was very rare that people then actually did it the following year because we're not very good at praising ourselves yeah that that is really key that we have been used to measuring ourselves on efficiency and time. Yeah, and, but, and ticking the boxes that are imposed externally. Yeah. Yeah, so just, oh, great, I've finished on time. I've been a brilliant GP today. You might not have been. You know, I know some really terrible GPs that can go really fast. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I've been really great. I've got through so much stuff. Okay, did you really think about that? How creative have you, have you been? How many people's lives have you really made a difference to today? And that's really, really hard to quantify or, or to count. But we've been really conditioned to, uh, yeah, just focus on the wrong metrics for a lot of stuff. And then we, if we're focusing on the wrong metrics or we're judged by the wrong metrics, then if those aren't the things that give us meaning or purpose, there's this complete mismatch and we know that one of the ways to, the one of the most protective ways about to stop yourself burning out is to find meaning and purpose in your job. So if you're measuring yourself by the wrong things, then your meaning and purpose is going to be at rock bottom. Absolutely. And I also think there's the, we measure ourselves by our accomplishments. And I think in medicine, you know, those are often certificates diplomas yeah. exams ticking off the boxes on our portfolios and I think it's really difficult when you then get to the end of it and there aren't things to jump through actually you have a higher level of responsibility and then you're dealing with stuff that maybe you don't have interest in like the management you have more responsibility for human resources perhaps mm. and people or or quality improvement and that's not your interest your actual interest is maybe teaching or I don't know a particular niche area of clinical stuff and I think I think another thing I wanted to say going back to the shape sorter is that you cannot be what you do not see and there's a there's somebody yeah I know it's a good one isn't it there's a there's a fantastic doctor called Dr Ronks who's one of the Operation Ouch doctors who's um, a, a black queer non-binary um, doctor in A and E and and they are very public about all of those issues in terms of 
people only seeing certain things and therefore those are the things in their shape sorter. If I only see surgeons, medics, GP, psychiatrists, op and gynae, those are going to be the things that I decide whether to do or not. And I think we really need to have a full understanding of what are the options and also think, does that always have to just include medicine? You know, we did a, an art day recently and there were doctors doing spoken word poetry and art and all sorts of creative, interesting things, which would augment them as a doctor because they are being fully human and satisfied and fulfilled in a way that we would love in our patients. And so just giving ourselves that permission to go, well, what else is there about me? Um, and perhaps looking around and going, what are other doctors doing? Because there are so many of us doing really different things. I, I'm pretty sure there will be people doing stuff like me, but maybe not the exact version of it. And how do you see that stuff? Um, and lift up your eyes from your sort of day to day and think a bit more creatively about it and have that curiosity. Yeah, it's, it's all about how we measure ourselves, isn't it, at the end of the day? I, I remember Serena, Dr. Serena Chibber came on the podcast recently, um, co-founder of um, My Local Manager, and she was saying when she had some coaching, her coach said, um, she had this massive to-do list, she said, Serena, what's on your to-be list, not your to-do list? And I, th there's a, a lovely quote, I think it may be Maya Angelou, but it's, it says, you'll be remembered by what brought you the most joy. And then there is definite Maya Angelou quote is, you know, people remember how you made them feel, not what you did. And mm. at the moment, we measure ourselves on, on what we do, how much we're achieving, what, what we're getting through. And I think a lot of doctors are just measuring themselves on, have I survived this year? You know, have I managed to get through this year without burning out? Have I survived the job? Well, for me, that's not quite enough to think, have I just survived? It's like, am I thriving? And are the people around me thriving too? Because if I'm thriving at the, the expense of somebody else, then I know that I'm probably doing something wrong as well. But am I thriving? Are my colleagues thriving? Are my family thriving? Are my friends thriving? And what have I... What have, what have I given to them as opposed to am I just at work all the time just working my socks off and you, you go back to that absolute cliche about you know no one ever said on their deathbed I wish I'd spend more time in the office <laughs> but we we always forget that don't we we just prioritize work and achievement above everything else in our lives I think it's very common and I think trying to tune in more to the non-metric achievements, I think is a, is a skill and it's a, a bit like with mindfulness and tuning into your unhelpful thoughts. It's, it's something that you can tune into. And I think that's where things like gratitudes can come in really handy for making you try to pay, give, give things the importance that they're due and go, okay, perhaps if I want to really focus on the human interactions. Okay, what are the what were the positives about my interactions with other people today? And you can start noticing those things because I know when I had a really long to-do list and I just emptied it all out onto a page, I didn't feel satisfied and get that dopamine hit when I ticked it off. I just went straight on with equal intensity to the next one, even if that job wasn't that important or stressful. Um, it just felt like another thing pinged up in, into my horizon. So it's how do we allow ourselves real pleasure in those moments where something good happened or something that's special to you happened, no matter how small that might be. Mm. Good advice, Sarah. We, we, we're running out of time. So I'd just like to ask you, if you had sort of three top tips for professionals here at work, think, thinking now, well, maybe I am on the edge of burnout and you know, mind you, all my colleagues are, you know, what would you say in terms of how they can bring their whole self to work and not chop off those edges of the shapes that they are? I think the first one is about, you know, phone a friend if you think you are on the edge of burnout and when I say a friend I mean someone that isn't you in terms of trying to diagnose yourself we're horrendous patients and we're even worse as doctors for ourselves so 
really seeking help about that. Once you've got that ball in motion, in terms of looking at, you know, when were you last fulfilled or happy? And what about that brought you happiness and fulfillment? And and I mean that on a very internal rather than external accolades. Um, Really letting yourself think, when did I feel really satisfied in a way that wasn't just about making myself look good to others or fulfilling some criteria that other people may have for, for me as a doctor or in other parts of your life. Um, and I think the other bit is about giving yourself permission to stand away from sort of look in on your life and compare how your personal and professional values are comparing and just spend some time on that to really see what you notice and whether there are any obvious changes that you feel that you need to make as a result of that. Thank you. And we've um, released a a, uh, episode of the podcast about self-coaching just a couple of episodes ago, actually. And so I think, you know, if people do want to do that for themselves, self-coaching is a good way to do it. So go and have a listen to that episode. I think my top tips would be, you know, whatever you want to do, stay in your zone of power. So think about what choices do I have? What options do I have to make small changes at work? You know, maybe it's taking on that role and dropping that role. I think do a strength survey if you can. The, the VIA one is really good. You can also pay. I think there's a Gallup one. There's a Clifton Strengths Finder. Um, you can do that. It can be really illuminating. It, it doesn't tell you. It, it tells you what your top strengths are. It doesn't tell you how proficient you are at each strength. Though. <laughs> you know, just because you've got top five doesn't mean you can't do any of the others at all. You might be very good at other things. It's just those are what the, your preferred strengths are. And then finally, I think ask yourself, what am I going to measure success by? You know, what are my criteria for success? Is it going to be number of diplomas achieved or is it going to be the level of happiness I'm feeling on a day to day basis or the, the meaning and purpose and satisfaction in my life? Just ask yourself those hard, hard questions. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. If people wanted to get in touch with you, find out more about you, where can they do that? Yeah, lovely. I'm, I've got a website which is drsarahgolding.com but with a you like Ellie Golding the pop star and I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn at Dr Sarah Golding and on Twitter but I don't use that quite as much. Brilliant thank you so much Sarah and we'll have to have you back on the podcast I think there's a lot more we can talk about in terms of career development so will you come back again? Absolutely I'd love to Rachel. Lovely thanks a lot then bye. My pleasure bye bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcast. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.